Shalom, you guys, and welcome back to the channel. I am Jonathan, the Code Searcher, and we're still on this thing about the calendar. And I just so happened to find a really good source that's um, from 10 years ago from Nehemiah Gordon. Now, what I about, like about this source, you guys, is he goes into a lot of the questions I'm hearing on the calendar right now and some of the more intricate details about the history, when it was changed, and all those kind of details you're going to find in this video. So I encourage you, watch the whole video. And I got to say, Nehemia goes off on a, on a rabbit trail just shortly into it when he says the talks about care, right? But it's about New Moon, and it does tie in. But bear with him on this, because when he brings you around the full circle, you're going to see some really important things here, um, especially the questions I see quite frequently about um, the calendar and when it was changed. There's a lot of speculation, you guys. You'll hear, hear things like, you know, the Jews brought it back from Babylon that they were keeping the the um, the the solar lunar calendar, which is an agricultural calendar. Actually, you guys, you're going to see because because Nehemiah is like the premier scholar for our um, community and uh, and I mean you know Hebrews and Jewish speaking anyway he's going to show you the historical facts about it that the calendar that we know today as the Hillel calendar which is what the Jews are on and what also kind of coincides with the Zodak, uh, Zadok because they keep a Saturday fixed calendar which is exactly what uh, uh, Hillel's calendar is you guys make no mistake about it Hillel's calendar is not a solar lunar calendar, okay? Some will like to tell you that, but that's not the case. The calendar was intact all the way through, uh, through Yeshua, through the crucifixion, all the way into 325 AD, and then it started the, with the calendar tamper with uh, Constantine, with the Constantine edict on the Jewish calendar, and then finally in 359, the Hillel 2, which was the grandson of Hillel 1, came up with what they have today, which is a Saturday intercalated calendar. Nehemiah is going to go through that. And I'm going to point out some things that as he goes through that are really interesting facts. So if, if you're if you're motivated to loan the calendar, I would encourage you use this as a resource. Nehemiah knows what he's talking about when it comes to this. He is he, he actually found the lunar solar calendar when he was a young boy. And he tells the story um, in this presentation. Uh, it's quite interesting to see this. So it's false information. The calendar was not changed by Babylon, nor was it changed by Greece. Uh, it was changed under Roman rule, uh, but not before then. And all the way up until that point, it is, as you will see, a agricultural solar lunar calendar. Now, I do disagree in one place in this video where um, he, he shows the two categories of how to reckon the year. And one, on one side, you'll see where a rabbi uh, from the Talmud actually talks about the um, equinox and he cites Josephus, also uses the equinox. So um, it's, it's, I believe, his position that he does not support that way of reckoning the year. Here's what I've discovered, because he uses nature, okay? The equinox and nature are going to coincide, because one uh, is determined by the other. And here's what I mean by that. In the time of the equinox, when the light changes, you guys, and we go to shorter day, uh, longer days, shorter nights, this causes photosynthesis in plants, but also in animals that are triggered by this time of year, where it's time to reproduce. Okay, so I believe, and it's my position, and this is what I use currently today, is both. Here's why I use the the um, the information about the equinox. You guys, if you will uh, take a look. Oh, you gotta be kidding me! Hang on, let me let me pull it up <laughs> if I can find it. Hang on just a second. I got to pull up a picture that I took um, just the other night. And I want you to notice how the position of the moon, because this happens this time of year. 
where the moon is only in this position this time of year, and it's because of its position with um with the sun. Okay, so so it's in an interesting position. You might notice it like this. It looks like a bowl. Okay. It looks like a bowl. And is that let me look at it now? Yes. So let me blow this up for you. If it's going to let me show it, uh, it's not. Let me do it this way. So the moon will look like this during this time of year, you guys. And so this is how you can kind of reckon the the new year and the position of the moon. You see how it's laid on its side? And this is right after sunset. Okay, and that's when we're looking. The sun is just set up down here. Uh, and this is uh, below Miami. So very close to the equator, or very or closer to the equator than most are. And you see the position of the moon. Now, as the as the months progress, that will change because the set the the the, the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun changes every day. It's a different position. It will change every day, and so and with the setting of the sun, it will turn a, a, as it faces the moon in a different position. So the moon will start turning up on its side as we progress through the year. This is the only time of the year that this, and they call this a harvest moon. This is at the barley harvest right here at Passover. This is how we know from the sun, moon, and stars that we're in the right time, okay? So I would encourage you, if you are interested in learning this and you want to get it down, please um, consider the information that, that I'm about to present to you. Nehemia is, is a very good resource on this. He is unbiased. He doesn't have a dog in the race. He's, it's, it's really about truth for him. So um, please stay tuned for this very informative uh, information about the calendar, how it was changed, and what it originally was. So hang, hang tight here. One more time. There we go. All right. Here we go. What Eliezer Ben Yehuda went through 125 years ago, we're now going through with over the past few decades as the biblical calendar is being restored. And people are saying, who gave you the authority to restore the biblical calendar? God sent us into exile. Only God can restore that calendar. And until he restores the calendar, we have to continue to following the man-made calendars of the exile. Now, many of you hearing this may not know what I'm talking about. You may not realize that the modern calendar followed by most Jews today is actually not the biblical calendar. And in fact, any Jew with any kind of Jewish education knows that the modern Jewish calendar was established by Hill II. Hill II was a rabbi who in the year 359 convened the Sanhedrin, the supreme ruling council of the Pharisees, and he convened it because there was, the Pharisees were in a great crisis. The Romans had issued a proclamation abolishing the Sanhedrin. And so before the Sanhedrin was abolished, before the Jews, the last finding, final remaining Jews in the land of Israel went off into exile, Hill II convened the Sanhedrin for an emergency meeting, their last meeting ever, to decide what they would do about the biblical calendar. Now up until that time, the biblical calendar had worked based on the agriculture and astronomy of the land of Israel. And now the Jews were being sent off into the lands of the exile, the last remaining Jews. So Hill II said to the Sanhedrin, we need a system to use in these distant lands of the exile. If we're living off in Lithuania or Morocco, thousands of miles from the land of Israel, we can't very well look at the new moon or the agriculture in the land of Israel to follow the biblical calendar. And so what Hill II did is he, he set up an approximated system, a system that would guesstimate when the biblical timings would be. 
In the biblical calendar, the years were based on the ripening of the Aviv barley and the months and the visibility of the new moon. For years, Hill II instituted a 19-year calculated cycle, which was a guesstimation and approximation, which isn't so bad. For the technology of the day, this was correct about 66% of the time. If you're off thousands of miles from Israel and you don't know what's happening in the land, it's a pretty good guess. And he did a similar thing for the months in the calendar. And Hill II replaced the sighting of the new moon in the land of Israel with a calculation of average conjunction, which again was cutting edge technology of the time, and it gave a good estimate of approximately when the biblical timings would be. And from the very beginning, Hill II said that this would be the calendar to be used throughout the era of exile until the Jews returned to the land of Israel and the Messiah would rebuild the temple. Until that time, Jews would follow this approximated system, and only when the Messiah came would the biblical calendar be restored. Today we're back in the land of Israel. The largest Jewish community in the world is in the land of Israel, no longer in the lands of the diaspora. And the question becomes, why are we not returning to the biblical calendar? And this is a question many people began to ask about 20 years ago. And they began to look for new moons and look at the Aviv barley, the agricultural cycles of the land, and gradually relearn this information that was lost after over a thousand years and to re reinstitute the biblical calendar to continue to follow it to resume where we left off now the biblical calendar as i mentioned is based on a cycle of months and a cycle of years the cycle of months is pretty simple a uh, lunar month they're lunar months based on the sighting of the new moon and the lunar month can be either 29 or 30 days the way you determine the length of the month is that after 29 days you go out and you look for the moon if you don't see the new moon, then the following evening is then, by default, new moon, because quite simply, with the lunar cycle, it can only be 29 or 30 days. I remember when I first learned about this many years ago, when I was, I was very young, in fact, and I was growing up in the diaspora in the United States, and I remember very distinctly that for every biblical holiday, my family actually observed each holiday for two days, and this is called... Yom Tov Sheni, any Jew living in the diaspora knows what this is. And what that means is, for example, if in Leviticus 23 we're commanded to keep the Feast of Shavuot, or in English Pentecost, for one day, then a Jew in the diaspora will keep it for two days. And I remember asking my father, well, why are we keeping this for two days? I'd begun to read Leviticus, and I saw it was only a one-day holiday. And the same thing with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The first day and the seventh day are days of rest, of no work. So in my family, we would do the first and second, and then the seventh and the eighth. Why are we doing these things for two days, I asked my father. And he explained to me that originally, Jews would look for the new moon throughout the land of Israel, and then they would come and report that the new moon was uh, sighted in Jerusalem, and then a proclamation would go forth from Jerusalem, announcing to the world that the new moon was sighted. However, if you lived very far away in the exile, if you lived even back then in Babylonia, or in Egypt, these faraway lands, which weren't, you really couldn't uh, find out if the moon was sighted in these lands distant from Israel, then what you did is you simply kept both days. Remember, I mentioned how the moon can only be on one of two days, either after the 29th day or after the 30th day. So if you're in exile, you just keep both days. And there's, you know, you, you keep both just to be on the safe side. And this was done going back more than 2,000 years by Jews living in these distant parts of the exile. And to this very day, my father explained, Jews in the exile, can, in the lands of the diaspora, that is, continue to follow the second day of every biblical holiday. And I said to him, well, wait a minute. Today we have, this is before the internet, back then we had telephones. I said, Dad, we have telephones. Why don't we call up in the land of Israel and find out when they saw the new moon? And he explained to me that, Actually, today, nobody looks for the new moon anymore. Hill II came along in 359, and with the last Sanhedrin, instituted this calculated calendar. So actually, today, we know hundreds of years in advance when the new moon day is expected to be. And whether the new moon appears in that day or not, it's considered new moon day. And I said, well, now we're back in Israel. I mean, we were living in the diaspora, but there are Jews back in Israel. Why don't we go back to following the biblical calendar? And... and even if we follow this Hill 2 calendar, why are we keeping a second day for every biblical holiday, which, which has to do with, if you don't know when the moon was seen, when no one's even looking for the moon, and even when the moon is seen, uh, you go by this calculation, ignoring the moon. And, and my father said, well, the reason we follow this system, which is no longer based on the, the realities of, of the astronomy and agriculture, is that we're following an ancient tradition. And as Tevye said in Fiddler on the Roof, the reason that we do these things are 
Well, I, I wasn't satisfied with this. So that brings up a really good point, you guys. Um, this is well known in history and all of Judaism. It is not a hidden fact. It's not something that was discovered in Qumran. Okay. We all know when the calendar was changed. And it was well after Yeshua. It was almost 400 years after Yeshua. Okay. So it, this didn't happen during the time of ba Babylon. And they brought it home from Babylon. No. If anything... Babylon learned the calendar from Daniel when he was in Babylon, you guys. Okay, so let's continue with this. This answer. And I really wanted to go by the biblical calendar. I didn't see any reason we had to follow this approximated calculation, which later I found out was off by between one and two days every month, when we could simply go out and look for the new moon. Let's back up a little. Okay, now he just said something really profound here. He said... That the fixed date calendar is off by one or two days every month. Remember what I said about the remnant house and how from Passover to Passover, they're accumulating 10 days and how it applied to what is said in Jubilees. This is how it is. If you do not observe the new moons, you guys, it will accumulate every month. You will accumulate one more, two more, one more, two more, sometimes two days per month. That, that end up on your seven-day continuous count. It is not a seven-day continuous count, you guys. Listen to what I'm telling you. I'm telling you the truth. You, it accumulates 10 days. I proved that with the guys that are claiming that are on a Zadok calendar, and they're not even counting the days anyway. They don't even know that they're uh, 375 days every year. Give and take. Now, it varies some years. It can be less than 10, but it's going to be up to 10 every year, you guys. A little bit and understand how the how the, the biblical calendar is actually hardwired into the very fabric of creation. We're first told about the biblical calendar in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And there it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to separate between daytime and nighttime, and they shall be for signs, for appointed times, for days and for years. And the Hebrew word there for appointed times is often translated as seasons, but actually appointed times is more accurate. The Hebrew word is moadim. And moadim, or the singular moed, means a time that's set, an established time. And what it's telling us here is that the lights in heaven, the sun and the moon, somehow ha uh, are indicators for us for the appointed times, for the biblical feasts, for the feasts of the Lord. Our next book comes in Psalm 104, 19. And there we're told, Asayarech na moadim. He made the moon for appointed times. He made the moon for Moadim. And so clearly the biblical calendar has something to do with the moon. But what exactly does it have to do with the moon? One of the things people say to me all the time is, show me a verse in scripture where it says to look for the new moon. And there actually isn't a verse that says that. And the reason is that the very Hebrew word for month means new moon. The Hebrew word for month is Chodesh. And the Hebrew word Chodesh literally means new moon. You can see it used that way in, in, throughout scripture. Nehemiah is a, is a Hebrew scholar, you guys, and he just told you, because this has been an argument, the word hodesh. Some will say that only means moon, and I told you it's a synonym. It's synonymous. It both is moon and new moon, okay? Sometimes in the scriptures where it's just talking about the moon, and you can see the context in the scriptures that it's just talking about the moon, that's when it's moon. But when it's talking about the head of the month, you guys, that's new moon, and that is how synonyms work. So don't be fooled by the ignorance of people who do not know what they're talking about when it comes to Hebrew. For example, 1 Samuel chapter 20, the word chodesh appears with the literal sense of new moon. Now, if the word for month means new moon, it's a pretty good conclusion to say that the month is actually based on the sighting of the new moon. The Hebrew word for chodesh, month, new moon, comes from the word chadash, which means new or renewal. And actually, this is a word that many people are familiar with from the phrase Brit Chadasha. Brit Chadasha is the Hebrew word, which is often translated as New Testament. What it literally means, though, is renewed covenant. Brit is covenant, Chadasha is new or renewal. And the Hebrew idea of Chadash is, is not something brand new that never existed before. The idea is actually a renewal. And that's what Jeremiah 31 is talking about. The covenant has been broken, and in the future period that Jeremiah is talking about, this covenant will be renewed.
And that's exactly what a chodesh, a new moon, is. The moon is not visible for several days. It's, it, you go out and you look for the moon for several days and you don't see it. And then the light of the, the moon or the visibility of the moon is renewed to observers looking for it up in the, on the western horizon shortly after sunset. Now, the way the, the lunar cycle works, here we can see the sun, the moon, and the earth in a straight line. And this is what's known as the moment of conjunction. And at this point, you simply can't see the moon because when you look up, all you see is the sun. That's the first reason. The second reason you don't see the moon is that the side of the moon facing us on Earth is not illuminated. Now, here's a very important point that a lot of people don't get. 50% of the moon is always illuminated. Even at this moment of conjunction, half the moon is lit up, except the half that's lit up is not facing Earth. And so we can't see it. A day or two later, you have what then is actually the visible new moon. At that point, 50% of the moon is still illuminated. However, now enough of it is facing Earth that when we look up in the western horizon shortly after sunset, we can see the moon as a, as a tiny sliver crescent. And this is what it actually looks like looking on a, at the horizon from Jerusalem. This is a new moon sighted from Jerusalem. Here's another new moon which you can see from Jerusalem. Any simple ancient Israelite shepherd or farmer goes up to any hilltop and he can't miss seeing the new moon. It's just so clear. He, you know, the, the ancient Israelites were so in tune with the cycles of nature. They didn't have artificial lights. They woke up with first light and they went to sleep after the, after the complete darkness. I mentioned how in ancient times the new moon was proclaimed from Jerusalem. What they would do is they would light a bonfire at the top of one of the hills next to Jerusalem. And then someone on a far distant hill would see that bonfire and he would light a bonfire. And this created a string of bonfires at the top of all of the hills all across the land of Israel. And people far away, hundreds of miles from Jerusalem, knew almost instantaneously that the new moon had been sighted from Jerusalem. Unless you lived very far away in Babylonia or in Egypt. And in that case you, did, you couldn't see the bonfires and you had to keep two days for every, for every biblical feast. Well, today we, we live in a miraculous age where we can click a button and send an email around the world. And even the people in the farthest reaches of the diaspora don't have to keep two days. They can find out instantaneously that the new moon was sighted from Jerusalem. For a number of years now, we've been reporting these new moon sightings from Jerusalem. On my website, you can sign up for a free newsletter at karaites.com. And you get a free newsletter finding out instantaneously when the new moon was sighted. And so really there's no more excuse today to be following this Hillel 2 calendar, which was based on the idea that the Jews would be sent off into the exile. Uh, hey, excuse me. I'm down here in the corner, in the Karite corner. Before we continue, we need to look at a very important question concerning New Moon Day. We've just learned that the new moon is the beginning of the biblical month. But the question still remains, what is the status of New Moon Day? Is the new moon a day of rest like the Sabbath and the appointed times? In Numbers chapter 28, it says that a special sacrifice must be brought on the day of the new moon. But is new moon day really a day of rest? Recently, some people have suggested that the day of the new moon is a day of rest. They base this on an interesting passage in Amos chapter 8 verse 5. In that passage, the prophet rebukes the ancient Israelite merchants who could not wait to sell their grain to the poor. The prophet quotes the merchants who say in their hearts, when will the new moon pass so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? In this verse, the merchants are eagerly anticipating the end of the Sabbath and the new moon so they can sell their grain to the needy. It's clear why the merchants want the Sabbath to end. We are commanded to refrain from all work on the Sabbath, and that includes engaging in any form of commerce, such as buying and selling. In fact, in Nehemiah chapter 13, the people are rebuked for selling their wares on the Sabbath. The merchants in Amos want the Sabbath to end so they can finally sell their grain. But why are the merchants so eager for the new moon to end? This seems to imply that it was forbidden to sell grain on the new moon just as it was on the Sabbath. Based on this verse, some people have recently suggested that the new moon must be observed as a day of rest, even though that it is not commanded anywhere in the Torah. They also point out that there are a number of verses in Scripture in which the new moon and Sabbath appear side by side. For example, in Isaiah 66, verse 23, the prophet speaks about the new heavens and the new earth and the end times, saying, And it shall come to pass, every new moon and every Sabbath, all flesh shall come to bow down before me, says Jehovah. 
So in the future era, when the King Messiah reigns over the earth, every human being will come to worship before Yehovah every Sabbath and every new moon. On a side note, we can see that in the future Messianic era, the Sabbath will still be kept. Another verse in which the Sabbath and new moon appear side by side is 2 Kings chapter 4. In that passage, we read about the Shunammite woman, who is a disciple of the prophet Elisha. Elisha blesses the barren woman with a son. When her son dies, she decides to quickly go to the prophet for guidance. In verse 22, we read as follows. And she called her husband and she said, Send me, please, one of the young servants and one of the she-donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and afterwards return. And he answered, Why do you go to him today? Today is neither new moon nor Sabbath. Clearly, the Shunammite woman had a custom of going every new moon and every Sabbath to hear the words of the prophet. Interestingly enough, this woman's custom of going to the prophet is probably the forerunner of the synagogue. Today, the main function of the synagogue is for public prayer, by rote. But before the destruction of the second temple, the first synagogues were places for the people to gather to hear the words of scripture read out loud every Sabbath. Originally, the people would go every Sabbath to hear the words from the prophets themselves. Later, when prophecy ceased, the people would gather at the synagogues to hear the words of the prophets recorded in Scripture. In verse 24, we see that the Shunammite woman goes to hear the words of the prophet not only every Sabbath, but also every new moon. Verses such as these have suggested to some people that the new moon was intended as a day of rest, just like the Sabbath. The problem with this idea is that the Torah never actually commands us to rest on the day of the new moon. If the Torah does not command us to rest on the Sabbath, then how could the prophet Amos command us to do so? The Torah itself forbids us from adding new laws. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, You shall not add unto the matter which I command you today, nor shall you diminish anything from it. We are specifically forbidden from adding new laws to the Torah of Moses, just as we are forbidden from abolishing laws. This appears a second time in Deuteronomy 12.32. All that I am commanding you shall diligently do. You shall not add to it or diminish from it. Again, we are forbidden to add to the Torah. Even a prophet such as Amos would be forbidden to add to the Torah. This is made clear in the very next verses that follow in Deuteronomy 13. There we are warned that if a prophet appears performing genuine signs and miracles, but telling us to do something other than what is commanded in the Torah, we are not to listen to him. He is a false prophet who has been sent to test us. Clearly, Amos could not have added a commandment to rest on the new moon because that would have made him a false prophet. So why couldn't the merchants in Amos 8.5 sell their grain until the new moon passed? I want to propose an alternative explanation of this verse, an explanation that appears in the Targum Jonathan, an ancient Jewish translational commentary on the prophets. According to this explanation, the Sabbath in Amos 8.5 is not the weekly Sabbath, but the yearly Sabbath, what's called in English the sabbatical year. The sabbatical year is commanded in Leviticus 25, which says, Six years you shall sow your field, but the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest for the land. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. We're not allowed to plant crops in the sabbatical year. In verse 5, it continues, and it speaks there about the aftergrowth, meaning grain that grows from seed that falls during previous year's harvest. In verse 5 it says, That which grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap. It is a year of rest for the land. Some people stop reading here and erroneously conclude that we are not allowed to eat anything that grows during the sabbatical year. But actually the point of prohibiting a harvest is to allow anyone who wants to go into the field and cut as much grain as they need. This is explained in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 25. It goes on, it says, But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female servants, the hired servants, and the bound laborers who live with you, and your cattle and the beasts in your land may eat all its yield. So the prohibition is to carry out a centralized harvest. On the sabbatical year, everyone is allowed to go into any field and cut whatever they need for survival. This is why the merchants in Amos 8 are so eager for the sabbatical year to end. During the sabbatical year, their grain sits collecting dust in the storehouses. The poor don't need to buy any grain because they can simply go into any field and cut whatever they need. But as soon as the sabbatical year ends, grain prices will skyrocket and the merchants will be able to gouge the needy. This is what the prophet was talking about when he said in Amos 8, Listen to you who devour the needy, annihilating the poor of the land. 
saying, when will the new moon pass so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The ephah was a solid measure of volume like a modern bushel and the shekel was a measure of weight. The merchants would deceitfully use smaller weights and measures when they were selling and larger ones when they were buying. This was all part of the price gouging of the poor. The rich merchants are desperate for the sabbatical year to end so they can get back to business as usual, selling their grain to the poor at high and unfair prices. If the Sabbath in Amos 8.5 is the sabbatical year, what about the new moon? Remember how we said that the Hebrew word for new moon also means month? According to the ancient Targum, the new moon in Amos 8.5 is actually the last month of the sabbatical year. Throughout that last month, the poor can get all the free grain they want by simply walking out to any field. At the same time, the reserve supply of grain from previous years is dwindling as the sabbatical year winds to a close. The merchants are desperately waiting for the month that ends the sabbatical year to pass so they can finally sell their grain at unfair prices to the poor. This is the ancient Jewish understanding of the verse presented in the Targum, and it lines up perfectly with what we read in the Torah. Amos is not saying it is forbidden to work on the new moon day. Amos could not say this because the Torah never forbids us to work on new moon day. Instead, Amos is just speaking about the month that ends the sabbatical year when the grain prices are teetering on the edge of skyrocketing. The point in Amos is that the merchants want to take advantage of the poor by charging unjust prices in order to enslave them. Now that we understand that the new moon is not a day of rest, let's get back to Nehemiah. We know full well exactly what was done up until the time of Hillel II. We have ancient documents which describe exactly how the biblical calendar functioned before Hillel II. You guys, did you hear what he just said? He just says they have historical records and docu ancient documents that document how the calendar was all the way up until Hillel II, period. The agricultural solar lunar calendar did not come from Babylon. So stop with that ignorant argument that, that this is where it comes from. Okay, we're listening from a scholar here that, that knows. Hillel II came along and changed it in 359. One of the ancient sources is actually a, a pre-Hillel II Pharisee source called the Mishnah, which has an entire tractate called the Tractate of Rosh Hashanah. And there it describes in great detail how when the temple stood, the, the court would interrogate new moon, new moon witnesses to find out when they saw it and where they saw it and what they saw. And based on that, they would proclaim that the new moon had been sighted in the land of Israel. And here's a really amazing account that appears in this Tractate of Rosh Hashanah, which tells about an actual new moon sighting that took place in Jerusalem. And it relates as follows. It says, it once happened that Tobias the physician saw the Chodesh. Chodesh. Okay, now let's consider this because if, let's consider if the word Chodesh means month and, and it's used in the context as month. Let's see if it makes any sense. It once happened that Tobias the physician saw the month in Jerusalem together with his son and with his emancipated slave. Really? He saw the month. Or how about this one? It once happened that Tobias the physician saw the new moon in Jerusalem together with his son and his emancipated slave. See, that's what Chodesh is. Based on the context, I can tell you, and this is from the Mishnah, a very ancient text. And you can see that, that during Yeshua's time, before and after, it's a solar lunar calendar. And this is why Yeshua doesn't have to address it at all. Because it wasn't tampered with in his time. It was after. Remember we said it was the Hebrew word for new moon. So he saw the Chodesh. He saw the new moon in Jerusalem together with his son and his emancipated slave. The Sadducee priests accepted the testimony of Tobias and his son, but rejected the testimony of his slave. When they came before the Pharisee court, they accepted the testimony of Tobias and his slave, but rejected the testimony of his son. What this account tells us is that there were two 
two courts, two judicial bodies convening in Jerusalem, one of the Sadducees, the other of the Pharisees, and they both received new moon testimony. And somebody who saw the new moon would actually go and testify before each court. And what this tells us is that with all the differences among the different factions in Jerusalem at the time of the second temple, the one thing all the Jews in Jerusalem agreed upon was that the month began with the sighting of the new moon. Well, this raises an interesting question of what we do today, because today we don't have a Pharisee court and we don't have a council of Sadducean priests who are sitting in the temple. And a lot of people have said because of this, they've asked the question that they asked the question, do we really have the authority to restore the original biblical calendar? In other words, we don't have a council to say we've seen the moon. So how do we know the moon has really been seen? And that's a very valid question. And let's examine this. And ultimately what these people are saying is that we have to continue to follow the Hillel 2 calendar, which has the stamp of authority of the last Sanhedrin in the year 359, approximately a little over 300 years after Yeshua's, Yeshua's ministry. The reason we have to follow the Hillel 2 decision is because they were the last Sanhedrin, and uh, today we don't have a Sanhedrin, we don't have that authority today. Well, before we, before we decide whether we should continue to follow the decision of a Sanhedrin from 1600 years ago, let's understand what authority that Sanhedrin actually claimed. What was the authority claimed by the Sanhedrin? And we can find this out by actually looking back in this tractate of Rosh Hashanah and seeing a principle which is laid down there. And there the rabbis say as follows. They say, if the court and all Israel saw the new moon and the witnesses were interrogated but the court did not have time to declare it sanctified, meaning there was actually a ceremony where the members of the court would stand up after they heard New Moon testimony and say, sanctified, 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 if they didn't have time to make that declaration, the previous month is 30 days. What that means is, if the moon was seen after 29 days, remember you look after 29 days and if it's not seen then, then it's the next evening by default. If you look for the moon after the end of 29 days, and all of Israel, hundreds of thousands of Israelites have seen the new moon, but the court hasn't said they've seen the new moon, the court hasn't proclaimed it so, then it's the next day by default. And the principle here that the rabbis are laying down is that, is that the sighting of the new moon isn't what makes it new moon day. What makes it new moon day by definition is the proclamation of the court. Whether this moon is seen or not, whether the rabbis are even wrong or not, by definition what makes it new moon day is the proclamation of the court. And this comes out very clearly in a story which appears in the same tractate of Rosh Hashanah. There it tells what's actually a foundational story in Pharisee theology, which is the story of Rabbi Joshua and Gamaliel II. Of course, you all have heard of Gamaliel I, who was the teacher of Shaul, Paul of Tarsus. This is his grandson, Gamaliel II, who was the head of the Sanhedrin shortly after the destruction of the temple. And the story goes as follows. One day, Rabbi Gamaliel II was receiving the testimony of new moon witnesses, and they came and they said something that, that was completely impossible. They claimed to have seen the new moon in such a way that everyone sitting there knew that it, this was impossible. They couldn't be telling the truth. It's impossible that the new moon was really sighted. And Rabbi Joshua hears this and he realizes, wait a minute, they didn't really see the new moon even though they claimed it. Well, Rabbi Ga Rabban Gamaliel II accepted their testimony and he was the head of the court. So this actually placed Rabbi Joshua in a very difficult situation. What does he do now? He knows that the new moon wasn't sighted, but the court, the rabbinical court has proclaimed that it was sighted. So now he has, has, to, has a contradiction between the authority of the day and his conscience. Well, what he decides to do is he says, I'm just going to keep it in my house. And by the way, this was the seventh month, the month with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is a 24-hour fast. And if it was any other holiday, Rabbi Joshua would have kept each day for two days, one based on, what, based on the actual sighting of the moon, and the other based on the proclamation of Rabban Gamliel. But here he can't do it. He can't fast for two days straight for Yom Kippur, for Day of Atonement. It's too difficult. So what he decides to do is he's going to keep it in his house and no one will know and he just won't go to synagogue that day. Well, Rabban Gamliel hears about this and he says, absolutely not. Not only will you observe the day of Yom Kippur on the day that the court says, but in the day that you think is Yom Kippur, the day before, you will appear before me with your staff in your hand and your money purse at your side. And to a Pharisee to be holding his staff in his hand and his money purse at his side is actually a public desecration of the day. You would only do that on a weekday and on a non-holy day. You wouldn't do that on the Day of Atonement.
So what Rabbi Gamliel is actually ordering Rabbi Joshua to do is to publicly desecrate the day that he believes to be Yom Kippur. Rabbi Joshua doesn't know what to do. He's very distraught. So he goes and he seeks the advice of various rabbis. One of them named Rabbi Dosa, a little-known rabbi, says to Rabbi Joshua, he says, you can't defy the proclamation of the court. They have the authority of Moses. They sit in the place of Moses. If you defy the court of Rabbi Gamliel, whether he's right or wrong, you're defying Moses himself. Rabbi Joshua is very distraught over this. He doesn't know what to do. He now has this contradiction between his conscience of following the factual truth as he understands it and this authoritative decree of the court. He goes and he seeks further advice and he goes to Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva sits him down. Rabbi Akiva was the greatest rabbi of the second century, late first century, early second century. And he says, Rabbi, rabbi Joshua, it says three times in the Torah, you shall proclaim them, the appointed times, you should read it as you yourself shall proclaim. What's he talking about? He was actually using an ingenious uh, exegetical device, changing the vowels of one of the Hebrew words, changing the verse in Scripture to you shall proclaim the appointed times, to you yourselves shall proclaim the appointed times. Let's look at what that is exactly. Leviticus 23 verse 4 says, These are the appointed times of Yehovah, holy convocations which you shall proclaim them in their appointed times. And what that clearly says to anybody who casually reads that is you have to proclaim the, the appointed times. When do you proclaim them? In their appointed times. Rabbi Akiva, the first thing he did is he cut off the words in their appointed times. When he read it to Rabbi Joshua, he said, let's get rid of those words. They don't really uh, make the point I'm trying to make. And then instead of reading it, you shall proclaim them. Let's read it, you yourself shall proclaim. And what that now means, the way we're reading it now, and by the way, in Hebrew, that's the same consonants, just a change of certain vowels. What it now means is that whenever you proclaim those times is by definition when they are. You don't have to proclaim them when they're appointed. You have to proclaim them. You proclaim them whenever you decide to, you yourselves. And Rabbi Akiva explained what he meant. He said to him as follows. He says, you yourselves proclaim them, you being the rabbinical court. And what that means is even if you, the court, is accidentally wrong, even if you are intentionally wrong, and even if you are misled, and what this meant is the actual factual evidence, the actual factual information of when the moon was sighted is completely irrelevant. The holy days are by definition when the court proclaims them to be. Well, I have a real problem with this because that's not what it really says in Leviticus 23 verse 4. What it really says, as Rabbi Akiva knew very well, uh, is that these are the appointed times of Jehovah, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim them. That's what it literally says in Hebrew. You shall proclaim them in their appointed times. Not whenever you feel like. It is your duty to proclaim them, but you don't appoint them. The Almighty in Heaven, the Creator, appoints them. And so I have a hard time accepting this decision of Rabbi Akiva because he's telling me that the proclamation of the rabbis is what makes them appointed times and not the Creator. They become the feasts of the rabbis and not the feasts of the Lord. In other words, this would be the same thing as people who say they, they're not here to debate, but they declare something. Well, you can declare er error, but it doesn't mean that you're right. It's not Yahuwah's time, right? Especially if you've got more than a year between Passover to Passover. That clearly shows it is not an exact year on your calendar that you're accumulating days. Just think about this. It's mathematics, you guys. The month, the, the, month, the, the uh, numbers don't lie. It adds up that way. Well, this convinced Rabbi Joshua, and generally when you come to a rabbi and you say, why don't we go back to following the biblical calendar? Why are we following this Hill of Two calendar, which is clearly not factually giving us the days when the moon is seen, they'll tell you the story of Rabbi Joshua, and, and the conclusion from that story is, it doesn't matter when the moon is actually visible, it only matters when the rabbis say it's new moon day, with the moon sighted or not. Well, I, I simply, as a Karite Jew, a Jew who only believes in the Old Testament, a strict adherent of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Scriptures, I, I can't accept this. And really, for me, I could stop right here. In other words, just based on Leviticus 23.4, I have to reject this rabbinical innovation which changes the biblical calendar. Over the past couple of decades, more and more people are beginning to follow this biblical calendar. And many of those that follow the biblical calendar are, are not even Karaites. Many are actually Messianic believers in Yeshua. And they often ask me, they say, okay, Nehemiah, based on the Old Testament, based on the Tanakh, in Leviticus 23, 4, 
you don't follow the decree of the rabbis, you follow the, what you understand to be the scripturally true, uh, divinely ordained timing of the days. But what about somebody who believes in Yeshua and looks to the New Testament? When should we keep the appointed times? Let me try to answer that question from a New Testament perspective by simply looking at some passages in the New Testament and seeing what they have to say on this topic. Before I get to that though, let, let's look at what a well-known Messianic rabbi recently said on the issue to, to really understand what the problem is. He said as follows, he said, until Messiah comes back, who exactly has been given power over the remnant of Israel? Right or wrong, the rabbis remain in power until Yahweh himself restores all things. And what he's saying here is it's completely irrelevant what the scriptural truth is on this question. In other words, you may be interpreting scripture correctly following the new moon and following the Aviv barley. It's completely irrelevant because the authority is in the hands of the rabbis and the last rabbis who had that authority were Hill II and 359 with his son Hedron. And until there's another son Hedron with that same authority, you must continue to follow what they said, whether they're right or wrong. Let's see if that really lines up with the New Testament, that idea. Here's an interesting passage, Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 29. It talks about when the disciples are arrested, and it says as follows, Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin. By the way, this is not the Sanhedrin of Hill II. This is the Sanhedrin that actually sat at the temple itself. The disciples were brought before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And, and the answer here is that if the Sanhedrin itself gives you a direct order not to do something or to do something, if that order is contrary to what God has commanded, you must obey God, not men, because the Sanhedrin, that's just a bunch of men. That's not the word of God itself. And they don't have a divine authority. This is what Peter and the other apostles said. Another thing I hear, which is kind of comical to me, I hear uh, many Messianic rabbis saying this all the time. They say, somebody who believes in Yeshua should follow the Hillel II calendar because the Karaites are considered heretics. And I think that's kind of funny as a Karaite Jew who only believes in the Hebrew scriptures. That's ironic because what they mean is that the Karaites are considered heretics by the, by the rabbis. And of course, we consider the rabbis heretics. But, but let's actually examine that statement in context. Let's say, first of all, that Karaites are considered heretics. Okay, well, we'll stipulate that for a moment. Does that mean you shouldn't follow something in Scripture because the Karaites happen to say the same thing? This would be like saying the Karaites keep the Sabbath. You shouldn't keep the Sabbath because the Karaites do it, because they're heretics. That doesn't make any sense to me. This is a question of scriptural truth, not of authority, and not of following a particular group. But let's, let's put this in a little bit of context. Uh, the Pharisees both in ancient times and in modern times, the, one of the standard prayers that they recite, they actually say the prayer three times a day, is something called the Amidah. The Amidah is the basic rabbinical prayer which has been recited in synagogues for at least 2,000 years. It's also known as the 18 benedictions. However, today it actually has a 19th benediction which is known as the benediction against the heretics. The origin of this curse against all heretics is described in the Encyclopedia Judaica where it says as follows. It says, Samuel HaKatan, around the year 90 of the Common Era, composed the benediction against the heretics included in the Amidah. This was directed primarily against Judeo-Christians. And you know who they mean when they say Judeo-Christians? They mean the early Jewish believers in Yeshua. It goes on either to keep them out of the synagogue or to proclaim a definite breach between the two religions. So, you know what, if the rabbis call me a heretic, at least I know I'm in good company. Another thing I hear from people all the time is, well, you know, it's so difficult to follow the biblical calendar because most people who are, who are following the feasts are actually doing it based on the Hill 2 calendar. And it's, it's difficult to be different, and, and it's true, it is. However, it tells us in the Torah as follows, Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, we're commanded very clearly, it says, You shall not go after the majority to do evil, neither shall you testify in a matter of strife, to incline after the majority to pervert justice. And what this means is we can't follow the majority just because it's convenient or easy. We have to, be the, we have to follow the truth no matter what everyone else does. Even if we're the lone voice of reason, we must cling to the truth. You guys, every time you hear him say the Hillel to calendar, you must understand that this is the Saturday observance 
intercalated fixed Shabbat. It started in 359 AD under Hillel II. But the persecution actually started in 325 when when um, Constantine you know, pr promoted his edict, which prevented them from observing um, feast days and um, new moons and all that kind of stuff. The calendar was actually fixed and become a fixed observance and even punishable by death if you weren't on it in the, in the time of Roman rule um, in 359. So think about that. And that remains today. That's what they do today. All right. So don't be misled. Yeshua was on an agricultural calendar. This is why it's not it, it's not really um, discussed too much about the, the calendar in um, the New Testament, other than, you know, when there's there's prophecy about the times and the seasons being changed. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Hillel, too, means Saturday observance. A while back, I was examining this question of the New Testament vis-a-vis -vis the biblical calendar, and I came across a very interesting passage. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, we read, we read as follows. It's describing in this passage the various things that Yeshua accomplished in his ministry. In verse 15, it says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. And when I read this, I was curious, who are these rulers and authorities that Yeshua has defeated? Most Christian commentators who comment on this verse explain that the rulers and authorities are demonic forces, demonic powers that, that Jesus has defeated. But it, is that really what it means? Well, when I was trying to answer this question, I, I simply plugged in the, the Greek phrase, rulers and authorities, which in Greek is archas and echousias. Archas and echousias, I plugged that into a concordance to see what do those words mean, how are they used. And I came across an interesting passage in Luke chapter 12, verse 11. And there Yeshua instructs his disciples, he says, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, the archas and the chusias, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you are to answer. And this is very interesting because the rulers of the synagogues, the rulers and authorities in Luke 12, 11, is clearly not demonic powers or demonic principalities. It's clearly the rulers of the synagogues. And the people who rule the synagogues in this period and in this day and age were the Pharisees. And what Yeshua is saying here is if you, when you're brought on trial before the Pharisees, don't worry how you're going to respond to them. If that's what he's talking about in Colossians 2.15, the same rulers and authorities, then this has an important ramifications for our question. Let's read it again. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities in this period of the Pharisees and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. And then in verse 16, he goes on and he says, Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink, or of observing festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. Now, why would the rulers and the authorities of the synagogues condemn the early disciples of Yeshua in matters of food and drink or observing festivals, etc.? Because the Pharisees had very specific rules and regulations governing these things, and if the disciples of Yeshua were strictly following the written scriptures, then they wouldn't be following the Pharisee laws and they'd be criticized. And Yeshua is saying, or Paul is saying here in Colossians 2, Yeshua has defeated these rulers and authorities. Don't let them judge you in how you observe the festivals, new moons and Sabbaths. And by the way, he isn't saying here, don't observe festivals, new moons and Sabbaths. What he's saying is when you do it, don't let men judge how you do that. Another important passage that always comes up in the discussion of the biblical calendar is Matthew 23, verses 2 to 3. And there we read in the Greek version of Matthew, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. And here, whoever reads this in the English or the Greek, it's very clear that, that in the Greek, Jesus is commanding his disciples to obey the Pharisees who sit in the seat of Moses. And the argument is made that, look, the Pharisees who sat in the seat of Moses, the Sanhedrin under Hill II, established this calendar until the Messiah comes, and if you obey Jesus, who told you to obey the Pharisees, you have to also obey Hill II and his Sanhedrin. Now, the people who are saying this probably don't realize that the Pharisees have all kinds of rules and regulations that govern every aspect of their lives, from the moment they wake up in the, wake up in the morning to the moment they go to sleep at night. One rule I really clearly remember being taught, being raised as a modern-day Pharisee, was the commandment of how to put your shoes on when you wake up in the morning. And the Pharisees teach, a person must first put on his right shoe, but not tie it, then he must put on his left shoe and tie it and go back and tie his right shoe. Now, 
Is this really what Yeshua was commanding his disciples to obey the people that tell them which shoe to put on first in the morning? If that makes sense to you, then you should follow all the rules and regulations, but, but you can't cherry pick and say, well, we're going to do this one that the Pharisees instruct, but not that one. The problem is that in Matthew 23, 3, it does say whatso all whatsoever they bid you observe, whatever the Pharisees tell you to do, that observe and do. And it goes on to say, even if they don't do it themselves, they may not put on their right shoe first, they may put on their left shoe first, but you have to follow their instructions, because just like Rabbi Dosa told Rabbi Joshua, remember in that story, the Pharisees have Mosaic authority. Well, this clearly contradicts what we see in Matthew 15. There the Pharisees come to Yeshua and say to him, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And verse 3, Yeshua answers them and he says, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And, and here there's a very clear contrast between the tradition of the elders, those are the man-made instructions of the Pharisees, and the commandment of God. And what Yeshua is saying is it's the tradition of the elders which is a violation of the commandment of God. Now if you apply, apply this to the Hill 2 calendar, then clearly the tradition of the elders, the commandment made by the elders, is the Hill 2 calendar, which is a violation of the commandment of God. But how does this line up with Matthew 23? Well, in Hebrew Matthew 23, what it actually says, there's a slight difference, and there Yeshua says, the Pharisees and sages sit upon the seat of Moses, therefore all that he says to you diligently do, but according to their reforms and their precedents do not do. And the Hebrew for reforms and precedents is takanot and masim. Takanot and Masim are the man-made rules and regulations of the Pharisees. Takanot are actually laws that the Pharisees admit that they've made up, such as the washing of the hands. Masim are precedent which serve as the groundwork for further laws and man-made rules and regulations. In the Hebrew Matthew, Yeshua warns his disciples not to do the Takanot and Masim of the Pharisees, not to do the man-made rules and regulations of the Pharisees, and not to follow their precedents as the standard of proper behavior. And that's exactly what the Hill 2 calendar is. The Hill 2 calendar itself is Takanot. Hill II sat down with his son Hedron and made a new law that changed biblical law. The Ma'asim comes into play because Hill II and his son Hedron asked the question, do we have the authority to change the biblical calendar? And they looked for precedents of previous rabbis and they actually found the precedent of Rabbi Joshua that I mentioned before. And that became the basis for the authority to change the biblical calendar. In that story, the ruling was that whatever the Pharisees say is by definition when the biblical holidays are. And if that's the case, we can just come along and change the entire system. So the Hill 2 calendar is exactly the Takanot and Masim that Yeshua warned his disciples not to follow and not to obey. One thing that I'm asked uh, many times by people is, is, should a believer in Yeshua obey the oral law? That, that's an interesting question. It's actually a question that was asked 2,000 years ago. And we read about that in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5, we read as follows. It says, But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised. They were talking about these new believers who were Gentiles coming into the faith. It is necessary for these Gentiles to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. Now when a Pharisee says the law of Moses, he doesn't mean the five books of the Pentateuch of the Torah that you and I are thinking of. He actually means the written Torah as filtered through the, the instructions of the oral Torah. The two are inseparable in, in the mind of a Pharisee. There's no way to keep the written Torah without the oral Torah. And essentially what the Pharisees are saying here is these Gentiles need to keep the oral law. Now Peter responds and he says, we're going to tell them to keep the oral law. We couldn't do that ourselves. We Jews, we, we couldn't keep the oral law. We're going to make, impose that upon the Gentiles. James, the brother of Yeshua, has a different answer. In Acts chapter 15, verse 20, he says as follows. He makes the ruling. He says, we should write to them to abstain from, and he lists four things, from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. Now, when you understand this in the context of the written Torah, it's very clear why he's forbidding these things. For example, the prohibition to eat blood is something that in the oral law you're not even prohibited to do, but in the written law, every human being, not just a Jew, is forbidden from eating blood. That was commanded to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, although not according to the oral law. Uh, but he doesn't stop here. He doesn't say, just do these four things. He then goes on in verse 21, and he says as follows. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him. For he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogue. And what he's saying here is, these are the four things you need to get started. You can't go one day without these four things. 
The other things you'll get by coming to the synagogue and hearing the Torah read aloud in this, in, every week. Now that's a very uh, interesting statement. The way to learn the Torah, according to James, the brother of Yeshua, is by hearing it read aloud in the synagogue. And when he said that, th those were very calculated words. Because remember, he was responding to these Pharisee believers who were saying that these Gentiles have to keep the, keep the Torah of Moses as they understood it, which is the, the Torah filtered through the oral law. And James is saying, no, the way that they're going to know what to keep is they'll hear it read aloud in the synagogue. Now, the ancient Hebrew word for scripture is actually kara, which means that which is read aloud in the synagogue. And this is a very clear and distinct term. The word kara distinguishes it from the oral law, which is in Hebrew mishnah, which is that which is recited by rote. There's a very clear distinction in Hebrew between scripture read aloud in the synagogue and the oral law, which is taught by the rabbis, by reciting it by rote. And when James said that they must obey that which is read aloud in the synagogue, in the Torah of Moses, he clearly was saying they have to keep the written Torah. That's what these new believers coming into the faith, these Gentiles, have to keep the written Torah, not this oral Torah. So this is an old question that was answered 2,000 years ago. Well, that's the first part of the biblical calendar, the new moon, and we looked at some of the New Testament questions involved. The next part we're going to talk about is the Aviv barley. The biblical year begins based on the ripening of the Aviv barley in the land of Israel. When the barley reaches a certain stage of its ripening, the next new moon after that is the month of the Aviv. In the first part, we talked about how in the biblical calendar, the month is based on the moon, and we saw in Genesis 1.14 that year is based on the sun. But in Genesis 1.14, it didn't really tell us what about the sun determines the beginning of the biblical year. The answer to that actually comes in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, and there it tells us, Keep the month of the Aviv, some people in English pronounce it Aviv, but in Hebrew it's Aviv, Keep the month of the Aviv and do the Passover sacrifice to Jehovah your God at night, because in the month of the Aviv, Jehovah your God took you out of Egypt. And here is a very clear commandment to keep the month of the Aviv, which is the first month of the biblical year. And the question becomes, what is this Aviv, and how does it determine the beginning of this month? We see in another passage, in uh, Exodus, it says, You will keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread, as I have commanded you, at the time of the month of the Aviv, because in the month of the Aviv, you went out of Egypt. So what is this Aviv, and how can we actually find out what it is, and how it affects the biblical calendar? What we have to do is take a linguistic approach to Scripture. And let me illustrate this with an entirely trivial example. Many people are familiar with the phrase, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And if you ask the average person, what does wherefore mean? The way this phrase is used in English, they'll tell you, well, wherefore means where. Where are you, Romeo? But actually the word wherefore in Old English means why. What Juliet is actually saying in the original context of this passage is why are you Romeo? Why is that your name? Couldn't you have been called something else? Remember, uh, Romeo and Juliet's families were warring clans, warring factions. And what she's saying here is, why did you have to be from that family? Couldn't you have been from another family so that we could have gotten along? And the, what we see here is the way to find out what a word means in an ancient text, and really in any text, is look at how the word is used in the context based on the language as it was used when the, when the text was written. If we want to understand what a word means in the Torah, we have to look at how the word is used in the Torah based on ancient biblical Hebrew. And the reason that's important is that in modern Hebrew, the word aviv actually means spring. Whereas in Biblical Hebrew, it means something completely different. In Biblical Hebrew, the word Aviv is not a season of the year at all. It's actually a stage in the ripening of barley. And we can see that literal meaning of the word Aviv used in Exodus chapter 9, verses 31 to 32. And there we read as follows. It's describing the plague of hail and the great destruction caused by this plague. And it says there, And the flax and the barley were smitten, because the barley was Aviv and the flax was Givol. Givol is an agricultural term describing flax. And the wheat and the spelt were not smitten because they were dark, or in Hebrew, afilot. Now clearly in this context, it's saying the barley was destroyed because it was aviv, and aviv is describing a stage in the ripening of barley. So barley that is aviv was destroyed, and wheat which was dark, or afilot, was not destroyed. What we actually have here is not just a first clue and hint at what aviv is, a stage in the ripening of grain, but we also have what's called the semantic contrast Aviv is barley, which is ripe enough to be destroyed by hail. Afilot, or dark, is wheat, which is not ripe enough. It's less ripe than the barley, and therefore it's not destroyed by the hail. That's our first clue here, and really our first semantic uh, 
definition of Aviv. The next clue comes in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 14, and there we read about the first fruits offering. It says, And when you bring a first fruit offering to Jehovah, you may bring your first fruit offering as Aviv parched in fire or crushed Carmel. Now, Carmel in Bible, this is actually a Hebrew word. It doesn't mean the Carmel that we chew in, you know, in modern English. Carmel actually describes fully ripe grain, which is ripe enough to crush and grind into a coarsely ground flour. So again, we have another semantic contrast here between Aviv, which is not ripe enough to crush and ground into flour, and Carmel, which is ripe enough. The Aviv is not fully ripe, and as a result, it needs to be parched in fire. You can't just take it out of the field and eat it straight away. So what we have here is really, we can see three, three stage in ripening barley. We have the dark, which isn't destroyed by hail. We have the Aviv, which is ripe enough to be destroyed by hail, but not ripe enough to eat directly out of the field. You have to parch it in fire. And finally, you have the Carmel, which is fully ripe grain. Now, Aviv is often translated into English as green ears, and that's a very misleading translation. So what we just saw is that Aviv barley is ripe enough to be destroyed by hail, but not ripe enough to eat straight out of the field. It's actually in between young, immature grain and fully ripe grain. And green ears is a very vague term, though, because it could be very young green ears or very mature green ears. Here, for example, is a picture of some green ears, which are completely empty heads of grain. If you take these and parch them in fire, there's absolutely nothing that can be eaten there. There's no seed that's really formed yet. And so green ears is really not accurate enough to understand the precision of this ancient biblical term. Here's another picture of uh, barley from the land of Israel. And these ears are also green, but when you parch these in fire, you have grain that can be eaten as a vive parched in fire. Uh, how do we know that? We've actually taken grain in every conceivable stage of ripening and parched it in fire to see at what stage it becomes edible through the parching process as described in Leviticus 2.14. And this is what Aviv barley actually looks like. The third clue appears in Leviticus 23, and there it talks about the wave sheaf offering, or what's called in Hebrew the Omer offering, which is the first sheaf of grain harvested during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the first of the annual harvest every year. And there we're told, when you come to the land which I give you and harvest its harvest, you will bring the sheaf, the omer of the beginning of the harvest, to the priest. So very clearly, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we have to have grain which is fully ripe in order to bring the omer offering. If we don't have grain which is fully ripe, ripe enough to be harvested, then we're not in the right month. We haven't reached the time of the, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is an important clue for helping us understand the Aviv barley. It has to be Aviv barley for us to go into the month. Remember, the Aviv is not yet completely ripe grain. Two weeks into the month, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's now fully ripe and the barley harvest begins. So what we've seen here are three criteria for identifying Aviv based purely on scriptural definitions. The first is that the barley is light and brittle. It's light and uh, brittle enough to be destroyed by falling hail. It's the opposite of dark. And by the way, what I mean by light and dark is that grain, grains, when they begin to ripen, they start out very this dark green, and over time they become lighter and lighter until when they're fully ripe, they're yellow. Well, the Aviv is not fully ripe, but it is light enough that it's no longer in this dark vegetative state, which can survive falling hail. The second clue is that the barley can be eaten parched in fire, which tells you that the grain has developed enough, there's enough of a seed that you can parch it in fire and still have something left over to eat. And finally, we know that two weeks into the uh, month, into the month of the Aviv, we have fully ripe grain. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, in ancient times, it was very easy to find out if the barley was Aviv or not. And as soon as the barley was Aviv, there would be farmers all over the country that would report to the local priests, who would report to the priests of the temple, and they would prepare for in two weeks' time to bring the wave sheaf offering. The first new moon after the barley had reached Aviv would be the new, new month of the Aviv, the new moon of the Aviv. Two weeks into that month would be the wave sheaf offering. Today it's a little bit more of a challenge because very few people in Israel actually grow barley. And what we have to do is go around the country and examine the fields and see how the barley is progressing, examine the crops, and based on that, we can very easily determine whether or not it's the time for the month of the Aviv. Here's actually a picture of a barley field in the land of Israel. Barley grows everywhere in Israel. In fact, barley grows wild in Israel. It's native to Israel, and even when it's not planted, it reseeds itself, and you can find it in every hillside, in every field, everywhere. E even in wheat fields, you'll see uh, 
wild grains of barley. It grows everywhere. You can't even get rid of it if you wanted to. We're actually standing here in this location at a prime of Eve barley spot. Right over there, over that hill, are ancient agricultural terraces where barley was grown in ancient times and it still continues to recede itself year after year in the ancient conditions. This ancient strain of grain continue, still continues to grow and it can be examined very easily by simply driving down here and, and looking at the crops. Over the years, we've had a number of people join us in, in our Aviv search as, as we've been doing this over the past 20 years. One of them is a woman from Colorado named Ruth Ann Co, who actually came over to Israel on one of Michael Rood's tours. She heard me speaking about the Aviv barley and approached me afterwards, and it turned out she's actually a crop expert from Colorado, and she decided each year to come and join us and help us examine the Aviv barley. And it was very interesting when she joined us, because one of the first things she did is she started to handle and touch the barley and, and what we found is that the methods that we had developed over 20 years of examining Aviv barley were things that an expert crop agronomist does in examining crops. Uh, what we had, we, we had figured out with trial and error was what the experts had been doing based on their training. And what she actually did was confirmed a lot of the things that we had discovered over the years. And now today we, we can say with great confidence that we've really re restored and recovered this ancient agricultural term of Eve. Now the truth is the word was never really lost, but the precise exact meaning was something that we had to go out and actually look at the crops and see, see them and feel them and touch them and parch them in fire in order to see what exactly it meant. And here's an example. Here is a grain of barley, which is green ears, and you can see it's a plump, full grain. But when you parch it in fire, it completely withers away and dries up. Here's a, another grain which looks almost identical to the first one. When you, when you handle it though, you feel that it's a little bit different. It's much more firm. And when you parch this one in fire, it, it stays intact. And it's something that you can eat as Aviv parched in fire. And this is something you can only determine based on experimentation and examination year after year and really week after week examining the barley as it develops in successive years and successive weeks. One of the things people say to me is, you know, Nehemia, you go and you look for the Aviv just at the end of the 12th month to give the barley a, the maximum amount of time to ripen. And then the next new moon after that, one, one or two days later, is the new moon of the Aviv. But that's very inconvenient because some people want to come over to the land of Israel for the pilgrimage of the Feast of Unleavened Bread for Passover. And if you only have a two-week warning if the Aviv is found, that, that's very inconvenient. How could the Torah have given us this system which is so inconvenient. And my response to that is that, the, is that the Creator actually anticipated this in the Torah. In Numbers chapter 9, it talks about how the Passover sacrifice must be brought by every Israelite. This is the only sacrifice that the Israelites were actually allowed to bring in the second month. And it says there, if you're far away, if you're traveling on the road, you, you have a, that's a valid excuse not to bring it in the first month, you could then bring it in the second month because the Creator knew that there would be many people who wouldn't be able to get to Jerusalem with only a two-week notice, which is something that happens quite often. So this is something that was actually anticipated in Scripture. People sometimes ask me, is there any evidence for a 13th month in Scripture? The reason I say that is that if the barley is not aviv at the end of the 12th month, then you need to wait a 13th month and only after the 13th month is then the month of the Aviv. So what I'm often asked is, where is the evidence in Scripture for a 13th month? And my first response is that Scripture doesn't say anywhere that there are 12 months. In fact, it's not that we're adding a month. It's that we're simply waiting from one month of the Aviv to the next month of the Aviv. And really what that is, is it's from one uh, barley harvest to the next barley harvest. And that's actually a solar cycle. Because the barley ripens in the land of Israel once every solar cycle. There's actually a reference to this in Scripture when it describes Solomon's tax officers. King Solomon had a very interesting tax system which is described in 1 Kings chapter 4. And there it talks about how the country was divided up into 12 districts and each district would pay taxes only one month out of the year. That was a pretty good system if you think about it. Now it describes the 12 officers over each of the 12 tax districts. For example, district number 1 was son of Hur over Mount Ephraim. District number two was the son of Dakar over Makaz and Shalabim, etc. And finally, it describes a 12th tax officer. And then in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 19, after describing these 12 tax officers, it says in the original Hebrew, and there was one officer over the entire land. Now, it doesn't say that in the King James Version. There it says, and he was the only officer which was in the land 
talking about the 12th officer, which doesn't make sense. We just said there were 12 officers. What it says in the Hebrew is there was this 13th tax officer over the entire land. And why would we need a 13th tax officer if there are only 12 months? And clearly the reason is that once every two or three years you have a 13th month and in that 13th month, it's not fair to impose taxes on one particular district. So what they would do is extract the taxes from the entire land in that leap year with the 13th month. And this is actually described in some of the ancient sources. They explain, or they ask the question, when it says the one officer over the land, who is he? And it says in those ancient sources, this is for the month of intercalation. That means the 13th month, which one waits when barley is not aviv at the end of the 12th month. One of the things I hear from a lot of people is that we shouldn't begin the year based on the Aviv barley, we should base it on the vernal equinox. And they actually take this from a statement by Josephus Flavius, the first century Jewish historian, who says as follows. He's speaking to the pagan Greeks, and he writes, in the month of Nisan, on the, which is the later name for the first month of, month of the biblical year, in the month of Nisan, on the 14th day of the lunar month, when the sun is in Aries, the law ordained that we should every year slay that sacrifice, which was called the Passover. And many people look at this and they say, look, we have to wait until the sun is in Aries for the beginning of the biblical year, and it has nothing to do with Aviv barley. Well, the first problem with this is it doesn't say that in the Torah. The Torah never mentions anywhere the Aries or the vernal equinox. In fact, Josephus doesn't even really mention the vernal equinox. He just speaks about Aries. And Aries is actually a pagan constellation in ancient astrology. And the first of Aries in ancient times actually did correspond in the first century to March 21st, which is the day of the vernal equinox. However, there's something called the procession of the zodiac. And if you're going to strictly follow what Josephus said, you have to do the first of Aries as it is today, which is no longer March 21st. The vernal equinox is actually April 14th. So if you're following scripture, then, then really the Aries and the vernal equinox have nothing to do with it. If you're following Josephus, then follow what he really says and do it based on April 14th as the beginning of the biblical year. What do we actually know about how the biblical calendar functions in ancient times in the first century? Well, we have a number of ancient sources that talk about how they decided whether or not to have 12 or 13 months. And one of them is actually a fascinating document, which is the letter of Rabban Gamliel. And this was actually the Gamliel or Gamaliel, who was the teacher of Shaul, of Paul of Tarsus. And the story is related as follows. It says, it once happened that Rabban Gamaliel I was sitting on a step on the Temple Mount. One of the interesting things about this, this ancient source is that we've actually uncovered these steps, the very steps where Rabban Gamaliel was sitting. It goes on, and the well-known scribe Yochanan was standing before Rabban Gamaliel with three cut sheets of parchment. And then it describes three letters that Rabban Gamaliel dictated. And the third one goes as follows. Rabban Gamaliel said to the scribe, Write to our brethren, the exiles of Babylonia, and to those in Media, and to all the other exiled sons of Israel, saying, May your peace be great forever. We beg to inform you that the doves are still tender, and the lambs are still young, and the aviv is not yet ripe. It seems advisable to me and my colleagues to add 30 days to this year. So we see in the first century that they actually added a 13th month based on three factors the doves, the lambs, and the aviv. Now what we have to do is not just blindly follow what it says in ancient sources. We have to see if that lines up with scripture. And when I examine in the Torah and in the Hebrew scriptures for any reference to for the month of the doves or the month of the lambs, I don't find that. What I do find is the month of the aviv. So of these three factors, the one that actually lines up with scriptural evidence is the aviv. And this is what was actually done in the first century by the teacher of Shaul of Tarsus. There's actually another ancient source dating back to the first century which states as follows. It says, based on three things as the year intercalated, remember intercalated means adding a 13th month, three things as the year intercalated on the aviv, on the fruits of the trees, and on the equinox. This source actually does mention the equinox, unlike Josephus. Based on two of them, the year is intercalated, but based on one of them alone, the year is not intercalated. And then it says a very interesting statement. It says, and when the aviv is one of them, everyone is pleased. What we can actually see is that there are two systems that were used in the first century. One appears in this letter of Gamaliel I, the doves, the lambs, and the aviv. The other appears in what's called a brita, which is an early pharisaical document. And there it describes the fruits in equinox and the aviv. What the two systems have in common, what these two rival factions agreed upon, was the aviv. And that's actually mentioned in the ancient sources, which say when the aviv is one of the factors, everyone's happy because the rival factions don't agree on the fruits, the equinox, the doves, or the lambs, but everyone agrees on the aviv, because when you look for that in scripture, you actually find it mentioned, keep the month of the aviv.
Well, the Aviva is not just something we've rediscovered in modern times. It's been known really throughout history. It really was never lost. The precise meaning we had to rediscover in the last two decades, but the knowledge of the Aviv and the observance was something that was done throughout history. We have an uh, ancient statement called the Karaites vow. Remember, Karaites, like myself, are Jews who look only to the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Karaites vow goes as follows. When, when a Karaite would enter into the Karaite community, when, actually when he would come of age, and generally when he would get married, he would make the vow as follows. He and his wife would make the vow, We swear by the covenant of Mount Sinai and the statues of Mount Chorev, Chorev is another name for Sinai, to keep the holy appointed times of Yehovah according to the new moon and the finding of the Aviv in the holy land of Israel. Even after Hill II came along and replaced the biblical calendar with his man-made calendar in 359, there was always a small number of Jews that held on to the biblical calendar. We have one testimony from the year 1313 from a man named Israel the Moroccan, and he reports as follows about Karaites who were observing the biblical Aviv calendar. He says, the Karite Israelites who lived near the land of Israel, specifically the communities of Cairo and Alexandria, and the communities of Damascus and Aleppo, these communities send reliable emissaries each and every year to the land of Israel, who search out and investigate the barley in all the places where it is known from previous experience to ripen earliest. It's actually interesting that they looked for the barley that ripens earliest. Why would that be? Uh, and that if we go back to Leviticus 23, remember it says, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the beginning of the barley harvest. In Deuteronomy 16, it also refers to this time as when the sickle begins upon the standing grain. So throughout the land of Israel, you'll have barley ripening at different times and different places at different elevations. But the fields that are significant for the month of the Aviv are the beginning of the harvest. Israel and Moroccan goes on and says, If they find a field that is ripened, they take about two sheaves from the stalks of barley and bring them as testimony of the Aviv. They show their communities the Aviv and keep the Passover. The emissaries return to all these communities no later than the 10th of Nisan. This is an amazing account, an amazing testimony of what was done 700 years ago in Aviv observance. There's a couple of interesting points here. One is that they didn't know whether it was Aviv or not until the 10th day of the month. That means many, in many years, they would have to prepare their, actually every year, they would have to prepare their houses for Passover and be all prepared to have Passover within five days, get rid of all their leaven, because until the emissaries came back from the land of Israel to Egypt and to Syria, they wouldn't know whether or not the Aviv was found. And the people were ready because there was just no other way to do it in the exile when they were scattered to these distant lands. Another interesting point here is they actually bring the Aviv back with them. They don't just sit in a court in Israel and proclaim the Aviv was found, but they actually send evidence that the Aviv was found because no one is saying that in the era of exile with the temple destroyed that we have a supreme council that can proclaim that the Aviv was found. The question today is what's the factual evidence? Was the Aviv actually ripe or wasn't it ripe? Was the barley Aviv or wasn't it Aviv? That's the question. And, and what they did 700 years ago is they'd actually stand the stalks of barley back so people could see for themselves and examine it for themselves. And today when we look for the Aviv barley, what we do is we bring multiple witnesses who can go back and testify to their communities and bring back pictures and other evidence, actual physical evidence, to bring to their communities that the Aviv was, was found in the land of Israel. What we've seen is that the biblical calendar, before it was tampered with by Hill II, was based on the ripening of the Aviv barley and the sighting of the new moon in the land of Israel. Now, even Hill II, who changed this system, only intended that to be used during the exile in the far distant lands of the diaspora. Now that we're back in the land, what's keeping us from restoring the biblical calendar? Now, the rabbis themselves admit, when the Messiah comes, they'll go back to following the biblical calendar and scrap this Hill II system, which was only intended to be temporary. But the question I ask is, why do we have to wait? As a Karite Jew, what I want to do is keep the Torah to the best of my ability in the here and now. Keep whatever I can, and sure, there are some things I can't keep. I can't bring sacrifices today. There are all kinds of things that we won't be able to do until the Messiah comes. If we look back at Ben Yehuda, if he would have followed this advice of waiting until the Messiah came, like the rabbis of his day told him to do, we wouldn't have millions of people living in the land of Israel speaking the Hebrew language. We would be back out in the dispersion, speaking the language of the, our captors, not in an independent Jewish state in Jerusalem. And really the question is this, are we going to be like Ben Yehuda's son who struggled to bring the Hebrew language back to life?
that little boy with his dog? Or are we going to be like those children who oppose this, oppose the restoration of these biblical things and stone the dog? Thank you. I really appreciate him and his uh, studies. And he's just, you know, another witness to this. And, and he doesn't have a dog in the fight. He did that video 10 years ago. It is what it is. All that information is researchable, you guys. And I think it's really interesting to point out the timeline of when the, the calendar was changed is not when the Zadok people says it was. Matter of fact, um, the calendar was not an issue uh, or a central focal point to those that were in Qumran. We're going to do a study on that. I found a really interesting article, you guys. It's going to be another video where we're going to talk about just who were the people at Qumran and what did they call themselves? Did they call themselves the Zadok or the Zadokim? We're going to examine that word. The word means righteous, but it is a proper name. It, it is the name of the high priest of David. But did the people in Qumran call themselves that? And you're going to find that uh, they did not. Uh, it's really interesting what they called themselves. And uh, you don't see anyone with uh, the, the name of that on their calendar uh, at all. Uh, so more in another video. So I'm leaving you with that. I apologize for how long it was, you guys. But it's full of information that's useful and spot on. And again, it's another witness to um, the, the fact of the matter. Shalom to you. May you bless you. We'll see you next video, you guys.